After that was, was agreed, uh, these HYBs, as we call them, they came with their own problems because they were very weak. They were susceptible to, 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 to uh, pests. And uh, they also required some special, special treatment. So the issue of uh, the fertilizers came in and the issues of uh, pesticides came in. So we, we see the past uh, pesticides being used and uh, the problem was like it was solved. But uh, what we realized, what we realized is that uh, these pesticides also came with their own problems. We will uh, all agree that uh, the world now is crying because of overuse of pesticides. The, what we call the synthetic pesticides. We call them synthetic because these, these uh, pesticides have been uh, formulated in the laboratories and they are compounds that uh, when they, as they break down and or before they break down, they cause a lot of harm to the environment. So the, the pesticides came in and now we are talking about how to reduce the pesticides and replace them with more friendly, uh, environmentally and health friendly uh, interventions. So we, we know that farmers in Africa, farmers in Kenya use a lot of pesticides. And uh, I have done some survey and I've seen that even before the farmer, farmers uh, plan for their, the, 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 the source of their seeds, what they first plan for is where they will get the pesticides. It is very serious because if a farmer A wants to plant Irish potatoes, she will first think where to get, uh, to, to get pesticides against the bright, pesticides against the bacterial wilt, before she even knows where she will get her, her, her seeds. That is one problem that farmers have. And uh, we know the effects of uh, the, 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 these, these pesticides, that one, they persist, most of them persist in the environment for a long time. And they will, uh, when they persist in the environment, they do a lot of uh, harm to the organisms that are living there, including the humans. That is one. Two, pesticides are also very, very expensive. Like in Kenya here, we, the, the, uh, farmers now are not able to buy these chemicals because of their cost. So they end up suffering damage by pests because they cannot afford uh, the synthetic pesticides. Then the, the, once the pesticides get into uh, the other systems, like the waterways, even the, the, the people who are not, who, who did not use those pesticides, but if they are using that water, we also get affected. So if a farmer here uses a, a particular pesticide, that pesticide is not only going to harm that, that, that particular farmer, but it is going to be a chain. One, the farmer is going to be affected. The, 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 the people who will be using the products, the pesticides that you get into the, uh, into the air or into the system will also harm other farmers. So it is a, it's a whole chain of uh, uh, effect to, uh, because of one farmer who has used a particular pesticide. And that is why now the government, like in Kenya, we are talking about safe use of pesticides. We have, we, we, people are say, being sensitized how to use uh, pesticides safely. But how safe is safe? What is the extent of the safety that you can take so that you say that you are, you are safe from uh, getting contaminated with these pesticides? The problem with our farmers is that most of them are not illiterate. They are illiterate and 
they, 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 they don't, they cannot understand the language that is on the containers that are carrying these pesticides. So what they will do is that uh, they, will, they, they will apply the, the pesticides and once they, they find that their crops are growing well, they are adamant about the effects that those pesticides have. Those <clears throat> who, who know the effects of those pesticides will not, will apply them on the crops that are supposed to be taken to the market. But they will have a corner, their own corner, they call it a kitchen garden, and the, the, the children and the family is directed to be uh, getting their, 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 their vegetables or their crops from there. So those ones are not displayed, but the ones for the market are sprayed. We have witnessed farmers spraying crops in the morning and, and uh, taking them to the market in the evening. So you find that even the, what we call the, 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 the share of life, the, the, the safe life of pesticides is not adhered to because the, every pesticide has specifications on the amount of time that you are supposed to stay before you eat, after spraying, before you eat your crop. So farmers don't adhere to that. There are those that are, are, are also using pesticides that are very, very toxic. Every, every container has what we call the safety color. And we always say if a farmer uh, 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 or the government has put it that all pesticides above the yellow color should be restricted, they should, they should only be used under very special circumstances. But do farmers know that? Do farmers care? They want pesticides that have if, uh, immediate knockdown effect on, on, uh, on, uh, on the pests. So they will go for very toxic pesticides and uh, they are happy when the pests die. But uh, we need to tell these farmers that uh, the way that pesticide kills the pest the way a pesticide kills that caterpillar, it is the same way that it is going to kill the farmer, uh, to kill him. Only, it's only that we need a little more than the, the caterpillar and uh, we, 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 it, it affects us. So it is important that we look at options that are, are environmentally friendly, options that will help our farmers to reduce or to, 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 to stop using pesticides and replace them with, uh, with more environmentally systems. So what we are going to learn today, and uh, for those who we have been together, we know that we are not going to look at a single system that, uh, that, that, that will eliminate the pest. And, if, and I want to caution, if the, even the people in the organic uh, world, in the organic agriculture world, that let us not have that notion that they are our, our, our solution is to kill the pest. Because when God created, uh, when God created, when God created nature, when God created everything, Everything had its purpose. And that is why we always say that uh, there is balance of nature. If nature is not balanced, nature has its own way of retaliating. So if you remove one organism from, the, the, uh, from nature, you will get some problems as you move along. Let us try to live in harmony with the organisms that are in nature, but let us see how we can manipulate them so that they don't, uh, they don't destroy what we are supposed to have as food. So we are going to use different methods that, are, that will manipulate the pest so that they don't attack our crops. So uh, first, we want to ask ourselves, what is this pest? 
Because many people have been uh, uh, thinking that pests are only are, are insects. I would say that a pest is not an insect. It's not just an insect. But an insect is an example of a pest. And I would say that I would describe a pest as any organism that interferes with the normal development of another. Any organism that interferes with the normal development of another organism through either causing physical injury or, or causing unfavorable conditions. The, the, any organism that hinders the normal development of another. If, for instance, a cow interferes with the normal development of, of uh, your maize by trampling on it so that it doesn't grow well, that is a pest to it, to, 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 the, to, to, the, to the to the maize. Or if it, it, uh, it bites the maize and it doesn't grow well, then it becomes a pest. Some of the, uh, so we are saying that some of the pests will cause physical injury. And those are the ones that we call the, 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 the predators. They will, they, they, they will feed on, the, on, the, on your crops. Then there are those that will cause unfavorable conditions. And the unfavorable conditions are the ones that we call diseases. So disease causing organisms are also pests. So examples of, uh, of, uh, of pests uh, are insects. We have insect pests. We have got uh, bacteria. We have got virus. We have got uh, fungi. We have got uh, mammals. We have got we have got mammals, we have got nematodes, we have got uh, other vertebrates, so all we have got weeds. So all those either feed on the crop or they cause unfavorable conditions, what we, we are calling diseases. So pests are not just uh, insects. Because many people think that pests are only diseases. So are we together, people? Yes, we are, Dr. Thank you. Thank you very much. You know, I may be talking to myself around here. Although I don't see the slides moving on my side, unfortunately. Oh. But... Uh, I don't want you to stop because I know what that can cause. Okay, okay. Let's continue. Let's continue. So we have got uh, bacteria. We have got virus. We have got fungi. We have got uh, others like uh, like 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 uh, arachnids. We have got all that age. Any organism, including mammals, including man. Man can be a, 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 a bad pest to some of the animals that we, we, we have. So uh, that is the classification of uh, pests. So some of the, I, I just want to show some of the, I have some of the mainly insect pests. I like uh, here we have this one, African borrower. If you go to America, they call it American borrowing. I don't know whether they call it uh, Asian borrowing or, but it, it originated from uh, South America. And uh, this one is mainly on, uh, we feeds on uh, different types of crops. It's like a generalist. You'll find it even in tomatoes, you'll find it in, uh, but mainly on tuba, in tubers. It will bore into the, in, in, into the tuber. And you can see it's, uh, it's, uh, moth, how its moth look like. We have got aphids. Now, aphids are an interesting pest for, uh, to study. 
One, we have got about 400 types of aphids in Africa. And they feed on different crops. Let me say that most of the most of the pests that we have will not feed on everything. They are host specific. The, the pest that uh, that uh, will feed on the Soranese family will not uh, feed on the maize family. So they are they are they are host specific. And uh, so you you find that aphids are very, very hard to, 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 to manage. Why? We have got about eight, eight uh, species of aphids that will, uh, uh, will, uh, will live together. And when the population is big, they will just, develop, they, we have called, we call the cardinal aphid. It will develop wings, it will uh, produce some hormones, and the rest will develop wings and they will just fly. The other thing that, uh, that is very, very uh, funny with the aphids is that uh, they have both the gametes, the male and the, and the female gametes. So their, product, their, their reproduction is quite easy and they, therefore they can reproduce very, very fast. They will attack you when uh, there is uh, less water, when there is less uh, water stress, and therefore, it is important to note that for you to avoid attack by aphids, you make sure that your, uh, your crops are watered. Something is, uh, yeah, we have, we have the, this one. This is called a stigma, it's a saka. It feeds on the leaves on, of, uh, of, of different of, uh, crops. And it, what happens is that it has got some, uh, some defense mechanism. If you touch this insect, it is going to produce some uh, very bad smell. That's why it is called the stink bug. Then you have the cabbage rupa. Some of these are quite common in different uh, areas. They are, uh, they are common in uh, different parts of Africa. The rupa is called, uh, it's given its name because of the way it moves, it loops, and it leaves a very big hole on your vegetable. And this one, the, the funny bit with the, the rupa is that it can feed 24 hours, seven days a week, 24 hours. As it feeds, it is excreting. As it feeds, it is excreting. It is that funny. Then we have the, the, the webworm. The webworm mainly is, uh, you will find it mainly on, uh, on maize and also on some vegetables. And uh, what happens is that it leaves something like a, like a web as it feeds. It's a way of attaching itself to the, the host crop. Then the catworm will, uh, the catworm is known by many, it cuts the, your, your crop when it is very young. At the base of, uh, of your crop, it will, it will cut it. Then we have uh, the diamond back moth. <clears throat> the diamond back moth is named after the, the back of the moth. If you look at the back of, of that moth, it has a, diamond, a color of diamond. And uh, for you to know that you have an attack of uh, diamond back moth, go to your vegetables, go to your cabbage, go to your, your, your kale. You find that it, it has eaten and has left something like a seal, like a sieve on, uh, on, your, on, the, on, on the leaf. That is the, the, the damage by diamond back moth. Then we have uh, the fruit fry. Mainly it sucks the, uh, the fruits and it is very, very damaging. And uh, you find it on uh, citrus, you find it on, uh, on uh, even, nowadays it is even feeding on avoc avocados, very, very destructive, the fruit fry. Then we have the mealy bugs. These ones are common among, uh, the, the, in the, uh, with, among the many fruit uh, species that we have. And even some of the beans uh, have the mealy bugs. 
Then uh, I can jump a bit. Then we have the, 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 the snails. Snails have really become bad pests. They, they really feed on, uh, on, uh, on the vegetables. And one problem is that uh, very few people have done research on uh, pesticides for, for snails. So it's a, it's a real a problem. Then we have the, the leaf miners, that's the damage by leaf miners. The spider mites, you can see how it draws, it feeds, uh, draws like lines on, uh, on the leaf of the crops. Then we have the drips. The drips are suck, but they leave things like holes. And you can see on the right, the damage by the, by the drips. Yeah, and then we have the, the, the white flies, also very, very damaging. So we have the fall armyworm. This is the fall armyworm, mainly attacking uh, the, 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 the maize and the, 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 the cereal family. Then uh, we, we can go back here. Yeah, we have uh, weeds also. This is called the uh, uh, striga weed. And uh, what happens is that uh, when you plant your, your, your crop, be it maize, be it sorghum, millet, or such. It grows very fast and has a very, it establishes itself very fast. And therefore, what happens is it also attaches itself to your crop such that your crop like is like, it is shocked. And all the it sucks all the nutrients allowed and leaves your crop with no nutrients. That is the the striga the, the, the striga the Then uh, we have also diseases like we have the root not nematodes. Nematodes are a little a little uh, problem. We shall look at uh, at them later. Then uh, we we have another another disease the adrachnos. This one is you can see the damage that is caused by the adrachnos. This is bacterial root. Bacterial root. The leaves start withering within a, within a, you will just find the leaves with, with a leaf. Then we have black rot. Black rot is mainly in the plastic family. And uh, what happens is that the leaves start to dry on the edges, uh, on the, along the edges, as when they are drying, it has already attacked up to the stem. And uh, this is this is the damage by black lot. Then we have the blight. This is early blight. Then we have uh, fusarium root. Fusarium root will attack mainly when uh, uh, there is water stress. Like around this period when it was very dry, many farmers have cried that they have fusarium root because it will attack when there is water stress and also when uh, cash, there is calcium deficiency. Then uh, we have a, a late blight. It will attack the fruits and also attack the, the leaves. Powdery mildew is very, very common. Yeah, those are the examples of uh, the pest that we, uh, I was able to, to collect, but there have been many, many more. So you can see that some of them are disease-causing disease organisms. Others are, are, uh, are, 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 we have predators. I have not been able to put the animals like, uh, like monkeys, the animals like uh, even birds. So we, we, we have those predators also destroying our crops. Any question? Yes, if you have any questions, please post on the chat and I'm going to raise uh, your, your question. For now, we have a question from Mr. Francis. Welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mihindo. Thank you, Ratemo and the entire team. I think this is uh, very commendable. Um, thank you for diving deep into into the worms and into the diseases. 
Of course, there are many questions, but I'll just ask those that I have uh, a direct interest in. Yes. What would I do uh, when I have black rot and uh, blight in tomatoes? Because I have these actually at home. And uh, I think in some of them I've seen black rot. Of course, from my um, knowledge, I have uprooted and I have uh, again put them into my uh, composting. So I want advice. Am I doing the right thing? Should people do that? Mm. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. I think I think we are going to answer that as we move, move along. Eh? Okay. Yes, yes. Just, just let us let us continue. Then we will uh, we, we will we will answer some of those questions that we as we move along. Yes, um, there are some questions on the chat. Maybe I can read them out for you to just have them in mind. Yes. Either you answer yes. now or after your presentation. So yes. we have a question from Mr. Patrick. He was asking about how can we manage uh, white flies? You can oh, just white have, flies. Yes. And then yes. In a question from Marcy. What are some of the pestidol plants? Yeah? I guess plants, <laughs> yes, plants that are pesticides on their own, if I'm not sure. Yes. Yeah. Then the yes. question from Elsie on watch from uh, Mission Africa, she's asking, what is the difference between powdery mildew and downy mildew? I repeat, what is mm -hmm. the difference between Powdery mildew and downy mildew. You can either mm -hmm. respond now, or if you have a presentation with the answers, I just leave it. Thank you. Oh, okay, okay, okay. I think what we need, to, what, uh, what, what I need to do is most of these questions. I'm going to ask to answer them as. Uh, as I, I move along. And uh, so uh, uh, I think participants should uh, just wait. And uh, we, as we continue, most of the questions will be, will be answered. And uh, for, for the person who has, has asked about powdery mildew and uh, the, uh, powdery mildew and uh, downy mildew, the one, they are both fungal diseases. And powdery, you realize them about uh, uh, on their appearance. And uh, powdery mildew, as it is called, it looks like powder. While you'll uh, find downy mildew as spotty spot, uh, spots, like yellowish spots on your on your uh, on the leaves of your crops. But they are both uh, they are both uh, fungal, and uh, and their management is also different. I think about management, I'm going to talk about it later. But that is how you differentiate between downy mildew and uh, powdery mildew. Can I add something, Dr. Tari? Yes, please. On the same, yeah. Well, with, the, um, with, with the powdery mildew, yes. the, 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 the disease often causes death, um, doesn't cause death of the plants. Yes, it reduces the value. Yes, of the plant, but down mild you will always kill the plant. So that's another major major difference. Yeah, and also powder and also down mildew will come when uh, the uh, uh, when the conditions are very humid and wet. Eh? Yes, correct. Yeah, yeah, that's that's the other difference. 
Okay. So can we continue? Yes. Yeah, so, so we have said that uh, we, we have given the, advantage, the, the disadvantages of the use of synthetic pesticides. And uh, it is very, very important to note that now farmers are left at crossroads. They are told that these pesticides are very dangerous. And then what options do we have? So we are now going to use, to introduce what we call integrated pest management. And uh, I know this is not a new topic to us. We, 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 we have been discussing about it, but just for, for, for those people who are uh, uh, listening the past time, what is integrated pest management or IPM? We are saying that it is a, a, an ecosystem approach to crop production and protection that combines different management strategies and practices to grow healthy crops and minimize the use of pesticides. That is the easiest or the simplest definition of uh, integrated pest management or ecological pest management. So we are not using one single approach. We are using different approaches. And here, what we are saying is that uh, we combine them and we use them as a management strategy. Another definition is, is an ecosystem based approach that tries to use different methods to reduce the pest population to below economic injury levels. So we are saying that we are not eliminating the pest. Remember, we said that every, every organism in the world is important. So we are saying that we want to reduce their population to levels that will not make you use, uh, do some economic calculations. So that is what we are saying. But, and again, we are saying that we are not using one particular method. We are combining different methods to keep the pest population to uh, levels that will not disturb you. So that is the simplest definition. Other people say that uh, the uh, integrated pest management is a combination of, uh, of common sense methods. So that is another definition. Common sense methods because it's you are using manipulative methods to uh, on the pests. So you're trying to manipulate their population. You're trying to, 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 to move around, to see what, we, what you can do so that your, pest, your plants are not attacked by pests. And uh, as I said, many farmers now, their attitude is set. They, are, they have a notion that unless I spray my crops, they cannot grow. Maybe, there are conditions that are making the pest to come to your crops. And if you remove those conditions, then the pest will not come. So they don't look at the conditions that are, 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 are favorable to the crop, to, 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 to the pest. But the, all they know is that for you to kill a caterpillar, you must use this chemical. So they will have it in their farms and they always play, whether the crops have uh, the pests or not, they will, they will spray them. So it is important to note that when we are talking to our farmers and even when we are, we are, we, we are training them, let us, let us show them how to, be, to prevent our crops from being at the attack by pests rather than how to, uh, to solve the problems caused by pests. It is very, very important. And that is why we are saying other IPM 
we have got we we are going to use different methods to manipulate the pest population to levels to to below levels causing economic injury. And uh, the other thing that the, 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 the farmers uh, should know, whether you use whether you use the chemicals, and you have not uh, improved the conditions of your land, of your farm, pests will always attack you. But the moment you remove the conditions, then the, the, the favorable conditions, you'll have no problems with the with the pests. Now, I hope that one is clear. So we are not using one single one single uh, method. We are combining different management strategies. I'm talking about management. I'm not talking about control. Because when it, we talk about control, we are talking about eliminating these uh, organisms completely. But as I said, they are, they are still important. They are still very, very important. And uh, let us ask ourselves, what should, we, should I know when I have an attack by a particular pest? There is one question that we should always tell the farmers to ask themselves. When you find a pest in your farm, ask, uh, tell the farm, uh, ask yourself, what have I done? Or what have I not done in this farm that is encouraging this pest to come to me and not go to the neighbor? What have I done? Or what have I not done? in this farm that is encouraging the pest to come to my farm and not go to the neighbor. The other thing that you should know is that you should be a master of your farm. Any little change that happens on your farm is very, very important, very, very important. And therefore, you need to, 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 to know your farm like the back of your, of your hand. You need to know how you, the, 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 either the positive or the negative development of your crops. You need to know uh, the, 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 the changes in the soil conditions of your crops and the obvious uh, uh, soil conditions. So it is important that you know your farm. Let us look at uh, some of the uh, essentials of an IPM program. One of them is uh, we, we need to do what we call monitoring, frequent monitoring. And the, this includes regular site inspection and trapping to determine the types and investigation levels of pests at each site. <coughs> when, you, when, you, when you do monitoring, you find that today you had so uh, five aphids. Tomorrow you have you have three aphids here. You have five aphids here. You'll see where you have more infestation, where you have less infestation. Monitoring is among the key uh, and essential principles or principles of uh, of uh, IP, an IPM program. So you'll know one. You have aphids, you have got caterpillars, you have got this other pest. So that when you are now coming down, then you do recording. So when you record, uh, it is going to establish the threads and patterns in pest outbreaks. So you'll find that you have got this, this, this pest. Tomorrow, you have, you have more of this other pest because yesterday you recorded. One of the things that farmers don't do is record keeping. It is important that we encourage our farmers to keep records, especially on, a, or, or, on the pests and other, other happenings in the farm. We, at this, 
at the, at, at the monitoring and record, and record keeping state, we call it, you do a daily, what we call agroecosystems analysis. An agroecosystems analysis is a system where you look at your farm and ask yourself, what is happening? What is happening today? First, the first thing you look at is the weather. You look at it is you you record that it is sunny. Then you look at the the, 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 the moisture of your of, of your soil. You say the soils are dry. You look at uh, the, uh, at uh, the leaves of the of your plant. You see that the leaves are withering a bit, showing that they have got some water stress. Then tomorrow you do the same, and then you can relate after some time you can relate the specific pest to specific happenings that are, are, has occurred in your, in your farm. That is what we call an agro-ecosystems agro analysis, a daily analysis of all the happenings in your, in your farm. So we are saying you, you record any happening, any pest population, including the, uh, uh, the distribution, and you can even try to say that I recommend that uh, this, this is the intervention at this stage. For instance, if I go to my farm and I find that there are two, there are two aphids, I just recommend crushing. I recommend that the, I, I crush the aphids. Tomorrow I find 10. So I recommend that I remove some of the leaves that are attacked. Moving like that, towards now the more critical actions that should be taken. The other, the, other, the other level is now setting what we call action threshold levels or action levels. This is where you say that now the population of your pests keep on rising. The population of your pests keep on rising. I have tried to, 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 to use water, the populations keep on rising. So you decide that if I find 20 caterpillars, then I have to take this and this action. So that is now where you just put the action that you are going to, 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 to take. And that is what we call the economic threshold, where now you cannot let everything go. Then uh, that is now the action threshold level. You say that at this point, I have to take action on the on on my uh, on my crops or on my fields. And some of the, 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 the some of the actions that you start with should be preventive. Should be preventive. The preventive measures should be incorporated uh, into the existing structures and designs for new structures. For instance, we, you, before you, you set your IPM program, before you start your, your crop cycle, there are some preventive measures that you, you, you are supposed to take. Even as you go along, you start now saying, okay, my threshold level is six caterpillars. I have to put some baits. I have to put some uh, some some uh, pheromon lures. So it is important that now you start using the preventive measure. The other important essential of uh, IPM program is evaluation. A regular evaluation program is essential to determine the success of the pest management strategy. Don't do uh, uh, strategies and leave it at that. Look at where you have come from and see where you are going. That is what we call the evaluation so that you understand if you can change your strategy or you will move on with the same strategy. Those are the, 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 the five very essential, uh, very essential principles or very uh, practices that are very, very important in an IPM program. <clears throat>
Now, we have said that an IPM program has to start by asking ourselves, what have I done? What have I not done that is encouraging the pests to come to my farm? You start by looking at all the normal agronomic practices. Because now we, are, we want to enter into what we call the IPM methods. And we look, you look around and look at all the agronomic practices that uh, you do. Those are not meant for, for pest management, but they help in managing of uh, pests. So look at them. Look at what you have done. Look at what you have not done that is encouraging the pests to come to your, your, your farm. So wow, those are the ones that we call the cultural practices. They are the normal agronomic practices in the field, which are not meant for pest management, but end up helping in reducing their population. Something like uh, timely planting. Timely planting will help because when you plant timely, and then like now, the rains in Kenya have come, those people who had planted just before the rains, not like me, I'm just planting. I don't know whether it will, I will succeed. I'm, I'm planting from today and it, it has already rained. So I, 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 mean, I have missed the first rains. So when they, I want to say that most of the insects pests will they lay their eggs during the dry season, but the eggs will hatch during the uh, immediately the rains come. They will hatch. So by the time the, the, the caterpillars uh, are able to uh, can can uh, cut or can attack your crops, they will have grown and they will be uh, they, 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 they'll be big enough to be attacked by the caterpillars. Timely planting is very, very important. And also the importance of it is also using the first rains that come. Then we have uh, things like uh, soil cultivation, making sure that your soils are well cultivated so that you can expose some of the pests to, uh, to their natural enemies. Or you can also uh, ex uh, expose some of the pests to their natural enemies. And also some of them, like the weeds, can die because weeds are also pests. It's very, very important. Then weeding, very, very important. Weeds, one, if you don't weed your, 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 your field, the weeds will compete for nutrients with your, with, your, uh, with your crops. And therefore, you'll have weak crops that are uh, prone to, uh, to, to, to pests. The other thing is that uh, some of the pests act as secondary hosts to pests. So they will stay on weeds, on the weeds, and when you plant your crop, now they will attack immediately. So it is important that we do some, uh, some uh, weeds. Like uh, we have so the blackjack. The blackjack is a secondary host to some aphids. So the blackjack will stay on the aphids, so, uh, the bean aphids. They will stay on the, on, the, on the blackjack. And when you plant your beans, they will immediately jump onto the beans and start attacking. Then uh, some weeds are also, what, there is what we call the cassava rot scale that uh, is, uh, and we have some weeds that uh, will host that cassava uh, rot scale. And they'll just, after, after, after you have planted your cassava, you'll jump on the cassava and start uh, attacking. Then uh, the other one is watering. We have water, uh, watering. I've said that uh, some of the pests will attack because there is water stress, especially the aphids. The, the aphids will attack because there is water stress. The other one is soil, soil uh, fertility management. 
it is very, this is key because if you don't have if you don't have uh, a good soil if you don't have a healthy soil if you don't have a fertile soil you will get weak crops and uh, what has happened is that because of overuse of fertilizers the soils the soil the health of the soil has deteriorated the, 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 the fertility of the soil has also deteriorated. Plants really like using natural systems. So natural soil fertility is very, very important. So let us encourage our farmers to use natural methods of soil fertility because the, the, the natural systems says that you feed the, the soil, the soil feeds the crop, and then the crop feeds you. But if you feed the crop, you jump the soil, nature will still uh, literally on, on you because it has to be a natural system. So we are saying that uh, this is why we, we are talking about making farmers understand. And that is why uh, the, the, the trainers who are, who are training yesterday talked a lot about how to develop natural uh, natural fertility, how to develop natural soil health. There are some organisms that also uh, leave uh, some pests that you leave in the, in the soil, especially the, 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 the pathogens that will cause diseases. It is important that we make sure that our soils are healthy. And how do we make sure that our soils are healthy? One, uh, when I listened to what, uh, what my fellow trainers uh, talked about, I, the, uh, 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 one of the methods is making sure that farmers understand their soils and the different crops that can grow in different soils. Then there is also the issue of uh, making sure that the soils have enough nutrients and making sure that the farmers do soil testing. Soil testing is very, very important for the farmers to understand the status of their soils. And for us who are practicing agroecology, I have been told by many farmers that uh, because we, I'm, I'm, I'm using a lot of compost, because I'm using a lot of, uh, a lot of manure, I have got no problem. And even the professionals are telling people that once you use manure, there is no problem. But how do you know that whether you, are, you have enough or you have more than you require? So let us encourage our farmers to do soil testing, both for, for, for fertility and also for pathogenic tests. Let them know whether if their soils have got a nematodes. If they have nematodes, then they are going to take, to, uh, to take the right measures so that they get rid of them. So the issue of soil uh, testing is very, very important. So <clears throat> then we have uh, crop rotation. We know that different pests attack different crops. And therefore, if you do the same crop every season, it's like you are feeding the, uh, the, 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 the pest every season. It is important that we, we, we do, we show our farmers how to do a good, good crop rotations and let them not rotate crops from the same family. Let them not rotate the crops from the same family. And uh, I think we, uh, somebody is going to touch on a lot on the crop, crop rotation, but it is very, very important. Then the use of green planting materials, whether they are seeds, whether they are, they, are, they, are, they, are, they, are, they are vegetative materials, use clean planting materials. And uh, uh, especially the seeds, farmers should be trained how to produce clean seeds. And I think we have a, a lesson on uh, seed production, and uh, I, I think that is going to be covered. In a nutshell, what we are saying is that uh, under cultural practices, these are the normal agronomic practices that we do. We don't do crop rotation so that we, we, we prevent our crops from, uh, from uh, pests, but it ends up helping us because even when we, we do crop rotation, 
we reduce competition because different crops have different feeding habits. We reduce uh, competition for nutrients. It is very, very important. Any question on cultural practices or any up to there? Yes, if you have any question on cultural methods or IPM, please post in your chat. For those who are here on Zoom, if you have, just raise your hand and we are going to give you a chance. Thank you. No. Oh. Is it is it that it is understood or they are two uh, things? It's a question, but not of cultural method, but on yes. is from Benedicta. My onions yes. are affected by black root. How will I control them? By black? Black root. By black root. Oh uh, yeah, rot. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, if I can also add on that one. Is, is that okay, Ratemo? Yes, please proceed. Okay. Dr. Mhindo, you had mentioned that you'll cover my question as we go along. <clears throat> and yes. I heard you speak about uh, removing the roof, the, the affected leaves. Eh? Yes. Just like the previous question is uh, kind of focusing. So my question is, um, if I remove these affected leaves, where do I, you know, discard them? Is it safe to put them into my compost material? Yes. Or yes. Am, I, am I harboring more aphids to come just later in, in the yeah. future? Thanks. Yes, for, for your question, I, I still have your question, Francis, but uh, uh, something I forgot to mention is that uh, the, the idea of composting is one method of uh, of uh, making sure that some of the eggs of some pests die. However, there are some diseases that, uh, like like now, if you if you put uh, if you put material that has black rot on your compost, it is not going to die. So, or there is another one called head smart. Head smart. You'll be you'll be spreading your the, 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 the pests to or the disease to your to the other uh, to the rest of the field. So some of the, the, the ideas that we are going to give will like for this one for head smart for black lot, you have to make sure that you isolate you isolate the, 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 the affected material and if you are able to burn. That will be the best option. But putting it on compost, you will be spreading the, the material. So, uh, uh, but for the, for the management, I think we, we are still coming to it. Thank you. Um, there are some questions I've posted on the chat from Facebook. We have from Hosea asking, how do we manage termites, especially in drylands? Yeah, termites, especially in drylands. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the reason why I'm not answering these questions is because we are we are still going on with the with the with, with the IPM methods, but I'm noting them. Eh? It is not that I'm ignoring them. I have noted termites in dry rats, all right? Okay, there's another question from Petet. Does crop rotation apply when one is using pumice, the agriculture volcanic rock? One, uh, does crop rotation apply when one is using? Pumice, the agriculture volcanic rock. Yes, I know, I, I, I know pumice. Mm. And uh, one, one, I know that pumice has very little nutrient levels. So uh, you have, uh, for management of pests, whether you are using pumice, whether you are using whatever type of soil, it is very, very important. 
Let me and continue, and then I'll have another session Good. for questions after. So now we are we have done one cultural methods. So the second one we are talking about behavioral methods. Now this involves the deliberate change of behavior of pets by introducing favorable or unfavorable conditions. So we said that uh, when you are when you are when you, are, you find that you have pests, you ask yourself what you have done or what you have not done. And uh, you can change the behavior of a, of a pest. One, you can attract the pest to a particular crop, and then what we call non-target crop, and then they will leave your target crop. And that is what we call the use of attractants. I have given an example in a maize field, Weaver birds really like, really like uh, sunflower. Their preferred food is sunflower. But if you are in the absence of sunflower, they will feed on, on maize. So if you have you planted maize and you plant some sunflower in between the maize, the weaver birds will go to, to, maize, to, 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 to the sunflower and they will leave your maize. So we are talking about the use of attractants to manage pests. So you attract them towards one, one crop and in the, in the process, they leave your target crop. That's the use of attractants. Then there is now chasing away. Mainly we chase away them away by use of uh, crops that produce a smell, that produce bad, bad smell that is uh, that, that, that is going to repel the pest. We, and those who are in uh, the organic fraternity, we know of onions, they repel quite a number of caterpillars, they repel some, some aphids. Then we have uh, garlic, garlic is also a type of onion. And then we have dania, that is coriada, for those who, who don't know dania, dania is coriada. Then we have plants like Max and Marigold, get is minuta that uh, has very uh, repairing re repairing smell and uh, if you look at uh, the tegetes uh, uh, mexican marigold very few pests will feed on it because it produces bad smell then uh, uh, we we have many more and let me say as as i i, I, I i'll talk down there most of this most of this uh, Repairants are also food for us. Then we also have some herbs that will repel pests. So that is what we call behavioral method. Or sometimes you can even put some barriers. You can put some walls. So when the pest comes, instead of uh, uh, penetrating your farm, it will just go back. So it changes its behavior. So the, that is also. Uh, behavioral method. So, so it is important that we know these pest uh, repellents. And uh, one caution is that most of us have been training that these repellents are pesticides. <coughs> Sorry. A pesticide is something that kills Mexican, Mexican marigold is not a pesticide when you are using it on insects. It's a repellent. But then when you are using it on uh, things like, uh, like, uh, like, like uh, nematodes, then it becomes a pesticide. So you must know when, what, on what uh, pest you are using these repellents on. Most of them will not kill. I have heard many people saying that onions will kill. They will not. They are going to chase away the pesticides, the pests, rather. So that is, behavior, that is behavioral method, which is very, very important. Up to now, we, have, we, are, we are still manipulating the pest population to keep them below economic injury levels. Now, the next one is what we call biological methods. Biological method. Biological method involves allow the use of living organisms to manage pests, what we call natural enemies. 
the, we, are, we are now, we have no, we have now tried to use, uh, sorry, before we, before we, we, we go to biological methods, to be, behave to be biological methods, we have another one called the physical, the physical method. This is where you use force. You, if you fight two caterpillars, you don't have to use a whole liter of, uh, of a pesticide to kill two caterpillars. The best option is to crush them, and that, that is it. So the uh, physical method, the use of traps is also very important. And uh, so it is, it is at a physical method, at a physical method. Now, under behavioral method, I want to add something else. The use of uh, what we call traps, what we call pheromone traps, use of pheromone traps. This one is very, very important because we are not using chemicals. We are using pheromones that are in the pest that we, uh, we want to manage. For instance, we want to manage, somebody asked about white flies. We have got white fly traps. White flies are attracted to white, to, to, to yellow or the, the blue color, to yellow or the blue color. So we have got uh, white, white fly traps that are in color, they are sticky traps. So if you put them on your farm, the white, all the white flies will come to those trap, to do those yellow yeah, sticky traps, and they will be trapped, uh, and they will not attack your, your crop. So one, the use of pheromone traps is very, very important. The other thing that now we are, we are doing, even as IPMA, is that uh, we are trying to, to, to uh, we are trying to establish the female hormones of some of the organisms. Let's say, for example, the, uh, the, the fruit fly. We get the female hormone, the female uh, pheromone of the female, uh, of, of the female uh, fruit fly, put it, in a, put it in a medium, like a sponge, and then we hang it on a, in a container with the either water or some as a dirty. And then after, when the male uh, when the male fruit fly is moving around, it will feel it will feel that it, there is a female and it wants to mate with that female. So it will go to the uh, to, to the container and in the in the process it will get trapped and it dies. That is what we are we are trying to use to manipulate the the, the the male population. So what has that done? When we remove the male population from the uh, from the field, the females are not going to reproduce. So we will have wiped out a whole generation of uh, of uh, of uh, fruit flies without using a single chemical. So we are so you what we are saying is that we need to use pheromones or, or, or lures so that we lure the, 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 the pest towards one side and they leave our, they, they, they get destroyed and they leave our crops. That is behavioral method. So let me go to the biological methods. And I've said that in this case, we try to use uh, living organisms to manage the pests or to manipulate the pest population. So these are living organisms that are working on others. And in this category, we have got uh, uh, two types of living organisms. One, they are organisms that will feed on, on the pest directly. They'll, that's what we call, they will predate on the pest. And in that case, we call them predators. And they feed on different, uh, on different stages of the pest. They are those that will feed on the caterpillar, they are those that will feed on uh, uh, feed on the eggs of the of the pest, and they are those also that will feed on the ant or the moth of the of the pest. 
So those ones are the ones that we call predators. They will predate. Examples of uh, uh, predators, I, I, I'll give down there. Then there are organisms that during the larval stages feed on pests. Uh, they, they, they feed on uh, pests. Those are called uh, uh, external parasites, or they will they will feed on pests, but they they also cause unfavorable conditions. And then there are those that will feed on will not feed on the pest, but they will cause like they will cause pest not to move. So they will cause conditions. Like we have that some wasps that will come and stay on the, uh, 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 on the pest, on a caterpillar. And the caterpillar is not uh, uh, able to move. Those ones we also call them, they are parasites and they cause uh, the caterpillar to be mobile so that it doesn't feed. That is another way. The other one, they will, some of them will deposit, they will lay their eggs in or on the, 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 the pest. And when the eggs hatch, the, 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 the young ones will feed on the pest and they will die. So we have got all those types of uh, uh, organisms. Then we have the, the pathogens, the organisms that cause diseases on pests, they include fungi, bacteria, viruses. So pests have their pests also. So they, 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 they are pests, but they also have their pests. The, these ones, they can, uh, we, we, you know, we, there are some companies that are uh, manufacturing some of these uh, organisms. We have like uh, Bacillus Durigensis, there are companies that are selling it. Then we have uh, the Trichoderma, and others that have, are now commercially being distributed, being manufactured and being in, be distributed by companies in Kenya and uh, in, in Eastern, Eastern Africa. So I'm saying that uh, we have got three categories of uh, these, uh, these uh, organisms. We have organisms that will feed on uh, the pests. Those are called uh, predators. We have got pathogens that will cause diseases on the pest, and we have organisms that will either feed, will, 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 uh, will at some stage, we <laughs> will feed on the pest and also cause unfavorable conditions that like immobility. So those are uh, the different categories. <clears throat> so, so it is important to note that these organisms are very, very important in nature. But let me first look at some of the examples. These are predators, the red bird. Everybody knows the red bird. It is a, it's an insect of Africa. You, but what, what I want to say about the red bird is the red bird is helpful both at the adult and the larva stage. You can see this larva stage is feeding on some aphids. It will feed the on the aphids. It will feed on the eggs of some pests, the red bird. Then we have this one, the hoover fly. You can see that that, that is the hoover fly uh, feeding on some mites. Then we have this one, as the assassin bug. It's also a predator. Yeah, this one is a, a chameleon. Yeah, praying mantis. Praying mantis is also a predator. The low beetle, a predator. We have uh, the, the, we have got some uh, about about three hundred types of predatory wasps. Wasps are really really important in nature. They 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 they, they feed on some eggs of uh, of uh, of uh, insects. They will feed directly. On some eggs of uh, on some in, on some insects, very very important. Then we have predatory drips. Remember, we said there we have drips that are pests, but now we have the predatory drips that counter the the uh, the, 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 men, the the drip menace. Then we have predatory mites. Then we also have parasites. 
If you look at, uh, at uh, the, the picture on the, on the right, you can see that wasp is ovipositing. It's egg on the, on the caterpillar. And what happens? It is ovipositing on the segments of the caterpillar. So the caterpillar is not able to move. And in the process, it will die. And when this when the young one of the of this wasp touches, then it will feed on this caterpillar. That is the action. Then, uh, then oh, you can see this one is also doing some of the position. Then we have the 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 the, 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 the trichnid fry, which is, is also uh, an ovipositor. Then let us ask ourselves, or even without without uh, without knowing what these uh, natural enemies are, we know that they they exist in nature. We are saying reduced use of chemicals that are non-selective and will kill both the pest and their natural enemies. This one has led to reduced, to, to, uh, the use of chemicals has led to reduced number of natural enemies that we have. So one of the things that we can do is in order to restore the, the natural enemies or to, pre to, pre to, to preserve the ones that we have is to reduce uh, the use of uh, chemicals, because we know most of these chemicals are non-selective. They will kill both the pest and they'll also kill the natural enemies. Then we have to, it is important that we grow, uh, we grow their food. Most of them will, will, uh, will, uh, will feed on nectar and pollen, and uh, therefore it is good to grow hedges of uh, flowers and uh, also leave life fences uh, so that uh, they act as hiding places or their habitat, the habitats, natural habitats, for uh, uh, so that they can thrive without any uh, problems. It is important to know that these organisms exist, and uh, their importance is as important as any other organism that we have. Marching and having life agencies to provide habitat for ground for natural for habitat ground for natural enemies is also very very important. Let us leave life fences and uh, so that we, we uh, they, they they hide. And most of them, as you can uh, you'll see, is they are very very shy. They don't want to be seen. So let leave some life fences. Yeah. Any question up to that? Yes, thank you, Nachari. We have a lot of questions. I will propose yes. uh, you finish the presentation and then yes. we have a session for Q&A, yeah? Yeah, I think, and I, I think we, have time. Move, we mm. have to move very fast now. And then we have like 15 minutes of question and answers supported mm. by the master trainer online. Yes, please. So continue. Yeah, they, uh, now we have reached the, 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 uh, the biological control uh, or management method where we are using the, the living organisms. Now, they have got, the other one is what we call the chemical method. I'll call it the chemical method because here we are using pesticides. And this now should be used as the last resort. When all the other methods have failed, we use what we call the chemical method. There are people who don't want to, use, to, to, to hear the word chemical. And I, I find it absurd because if you are talking about a pesticide, it's a chemical that kills. So under our system, we try as much as possible to use what we call botanical pesticides. Botanical pesticides, that they, uh, they are easily available in the environment and most of them have multiple uses, such as medicines. Uh, I'll explain to that, uh, that later. And uh, some of them have been commercialized. <clears throat> one, of the, one good thing is that they, they 
do not leave less use on crop produce and environment and the environment that's contributing to environmental conservation. Then the interaction between botanical pesticides and the pest is naturally biochemical. Therefore, pests are unlikely to develop resistance. What I'm saying is that it's, it's uh, uh, the, 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 the biopesticides, the interaction between them is biochemical. It is not chemical. It is not, there is, there will not be, there is no change of the system. So the system uh, the development, uh, resistant development is minimal. I, I think I need to move a bit past. Yeah, botanical pesticides exhibit varied modes of action on the target pests, such as they, 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 they exhibit different types of modes of action. One, repairing, toxicity, they, they are toxic, therefore they will kill. Through the regulation, some of them, some of the botanical pesticides will uh, inhibit the growth of, uh, of some, some pests and structural modification, making them suitable alternatives to crop pest management. They interfere with the, the insect behavior, physiological activities, biochemical processes, morphology, and metabolic pathways. I think I will not explain that uh, because of time. Increasing interest in natural pest products in uh, medicine, agriculture, and food industry has spurred research in the composition of compounds in various plant families. This is very, very important because we, you, a lot of researchers now are doing a lot of research on these biopesticides. And that is why we say it. Some of them have already been commercialized. We are, we, well, you can get those uh, pesticides on the, on the shelves and you buy them. So the, como, the common bio, uh, bioactive compounds in botanical pesticides are majorly secondary metabolites, such as steroids, alkaloids, tannins. What I'm saying is that not only research on the mode of action has, has been done, but also a lot of them now it is known that the, this is the acrid that works on this pest. So a lot of research has been done. Then uh, uh, we like like for neem, we know that the active ingredient is as a director indica, and uh, that one uh, that is the mode of action. We binding the acetyl chloride receptors, thereby disrupting the nervous system. It disrupts the nervous system, and a lot of Best, uh, biological pesticides would disrupt the nervous system. It also acts as a repellent. Then garlic, which is garlic, which is uh, it delays and inhibit spore germination. That is in a, in in a, in a, in a, in, a, in, a, in a weeds. Then inhibit protein and DNA synthesis. You see, they have got different modes of action. Then we have aloe. Aloe is uh, what is, what what happens is that. Uh, it will inhibit cellular activities, impairs permeability of plasma membrane, then uh, it uh, denatures proteins. Then uh, I would, uh, at this point, I would like to answer one uh, the question of somebody who say, how do I control termites? Then if you use alloy, any type of alloy, especially in the dry areas, this, you make a concoction of alloy and put it on, uh, on your, in your anthill, in the anthill. We have used it for control or management of termites. And uh, of course, the first thing you do, you can remove the queen. And uh, once you remove the queen, uh, which, which was what I was doing yesterday in my farm, I was, the, I was digging and removing the, the, the queen. But you can also use alloy. Take like 10 leaves of alloy, uh, crush them, put five liters of water, then put 20 ml of ethanol, 20 ml of ethanol. That is uh, uh, ethanol. Let it stand for 24, for, for 12 hours. Then you go and put it on, on the anthill and uh, the, 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 you will not have problems with the termites. Then we have Tegetes minuta. Tegetes minuta 
will inhibit the egg hatching, larva toxicity, structural modification, and also it will kill. So we are saying that uh, different, uh, different bio, bio, botanical pesticides have different modes of action. <clears throat> then uh, uh, the, the, the uh, mechanism of action of botanical pesticides, the, these compounds have varied modes of action against different pests, like the fungi, bacteria, nematodes, and plant host cells. Most, the modes of action include repairing. I think I, uh, I repeated myself in that. Then for instance, uh, pesticides from pyrethrum target the nerve cells. They are those that will target the nerve cells. And even the, uh, the, when we use the Frosia bogeri, it, will also, it also targets the nerve cells and it also uh, it targets coordination of the body, that is the nerve cell system. And the, so that now the, the, the pest will not think it will not move and eventually it dies. So, so most of these, most of these, while synthetic pesticides are more, 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 more host specific, and uh, the others will target, uh, the botanical pesticides will target uh, different types of uh, pests and therefore they are good. Now we, we or, or I, I have tried this to show that uh, different modes of action. I think we shall share this uh, demo with the, with the team so that we uh, because I don't have to, uh, time to go look at the, the active ingredients and what it does to the, to, the, uh, to the pest, which is very, very important for people to understand. But what I'm saying is that a lot of science has been, ha has been done. A lot of science has evolved uh, because of this uh, botanical pesticides. If you look at, uh, this is the Florosia bogeri, this is the chemical composition of rotenone. It contains rotenone, uh, 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 but rotenone can also be gotten from dairies, can also be gotten from the Florosia bogeri. When it comes to the Florosia bogeri, we have got different types of steporia, the Florosia. Please make sure it is the, uh, the species bogeri. Then uh, we have got uh, nicotine. Nicotine has been used for many, 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 many years as a pesticide. In fact, at one time it was considered in the dirty dozen. The dirty dozen means the 12 most dangerous chemicals in the world. I don't know whether it has been removed now, but it is, I would guess that it is still there. It is very, very dangerous. And it is gotten from tobacco. And uh, the, the, the mode of action, uh, it acts on the nerves of the, the, the organism. So it is, it, is, uh, it is a good pesticide, only that it is also dangerous to the humans. Remember I said that it is considered in the dirty dozen category, the 12 most dangerous chemicals in the world. Then we have neem. Neem has the, 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 act, the active ingredient, which is a, as a directing. The, 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 it's called as a director indica. And uh, the as a directing is uh, the, the mode of action. Uh, it acts as a, a, a repellent and also, and also acts on as a toxin to uh, to crops, that is the name. Then uh, we, I, <clears throat> I have put a, a whole list of, uh, of uh, we have a, a whole list of products that are now manufactured in, uh, in uh, especially in Kenya, and uh, they are on the shelves. We have by different companies. I have, I have tried to put this list. I don't want to go through the list for the interest of time. And uh, I think people will, will get this presentation later. So we have all this. Then uh, for us, we, uh, what must we do? We have got different 
botanical pesticides in our locality. And uh, what we need to do is let us try them with the farmers, but at some point, let us also try to include researchers in the process. They, they could not be very complicated researchers. Let us try to make sure that what we are, we are training to the farmers is working. And the other thing is that uh, let us try to as much as possible not to mix the compounds because once you mix different uh, uh, the different crops, you may not know what is working, and you don't even know the the, 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 the products that you are you are making. And if you mix them, let us try to, uh, to to involve researchers. Let us try to remove the scientists, and because. We have always been uh, uh, accused of not having scientists pick back up in our, in our uh, system, in uh, the organic agriculture system. So let us try as much as possible to remove, to involve research in whatever we are doing. And uh, I, have, I have just explained how to make uh, Lime sulfur brew uh, there, and uh, I think we, when we get this, when we get this, uh, when we get this, these uh, notes, I think you'll you'll see how to make it. I want to edit edit at that so that we can have a, a, a question and answer session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. For sure, we have a lot of conversations on chat. People have questions. And these questions are not only to Dr. Mihindo, but to our experts online. So yes. there's a question from Anne, Annie. How do I control ants in my seed bed from eating fleshy fruit seeds? How do I control ants in my seed bed from eating fleshy fruit seeds? Maybe uh, Deritu, I know you have seed beds. Maybe an attempt. Mm -hmm. to... Or Sylvia, whoever who is online, how do you control ants? Okay, let me share real quick. Uh, thank you so much, Shatemo. I actually learned um, something very simple from one of the BioVision Africa Trust field officers and it actually seems to work so you see with uh, when the ants are coming to the seed bed it means they are hungry and they're looking for something to eat and something that you can do is to give them the food you know especially when it's dry many people will actually confirm that some mites and ants are normally so bad because when you plant nursery or whatever they come and they bite the young uh, crops so what you do uh, when you're preparing your nursery, you make something like a fertility bed, whereby you add compost material down there, and then now you cover with topsoil. So you'll find that these uh, like burrowing insects, like ants that are looking for food and water, will actually focus on the compost at the bottom and not eat the crops at the top. I've done that several even there's a place on my farm where the ants always used to eat uh, the young crops that uh, young seedlings. But when I put compost at the bottom, I actually found that I gave them food to eat and they didn't bother me at the top. It's a very simple and almost a traditional method, but for me, it has worked effectively and you can also try it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sylvia. If you don't mind, you can also answer, how do you control fruit flies on pumpkins using organic methods? Uh, wonderful. So the pest that actually would um, affect the pumpkins is a metal a melon fly, I'm not sure it will be a fruit fly, but Dr. Mehindo can confirm, but a melon fly, um, you know, is normally uh, managed by using um, a pheromone trap, uh, which uh, is available, uh, you know, you can talk to um, uh, Dr. Mehindo and he'll be able to support, but then a pheromone trap is basically a trap that is able to, you know, it has a scent that will attract sometimes male or female or both male and female of those different insects 
And then once you're able to trap them, then they're not going to increase uh, damage. I don't know, I jumped in late. I don't know if Dr. Mihindo had already talked about pheromone trap and how they work. But then, um, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. If he did, maybe he can take it up. But then pheromone work very well for melons. And they also work, the melon fly trap pheromone will work for melons. It's going to work for pumpkins. Basically, in the cucurbit family, you know, the melons, the pumpkins, uh, cucumber, that pheromone trap works effectively. You don't have to spray anything and you can have safe organic produce. Maybe Dr. Mihindo, if you want to make a comment on that. I think I had talked about it that uh, we have uh, the, the yellow traps. The, most of the, uh, the white flies and uh, even the metal flies are attracted to either white or to, to either yellow or, uh, or blue color. And uh, they, they, uh, so those traps act very well and uh, you'll have no problems with them if you, you, you hang them on your, in your field. Yeah. Thank you. There is another question from Benedicta. After two days of mulching, my seed bed is affected by chymites. What should I do? Um, Ratemo, I think the response I gave earlier is still applicable. Mm. What do you think? I think it's yes. still applicable. The termites mm -hmm. are looking for food. They're looking for water. And I understand, you know, and also just to make sure that the mulching material is dry. You know, sometimes farmers, when they use mulch, it's wet, which is mm -hmm. still attractive for the ants to come and get water and food. So okay. make sure your mulching material is completely dry. Do a fertility bed whereby you put composting material below the topsoil, cover with topsoil, you should be good to go. It will work. Thank you. There's a follow-up question from Masi. Okay. Apart from uh, the traps, which other organic pesticides can be used on uh, melon flies? Um, I don't know. I think mm -hmm. uh, uh, Dr. Mihindo can comment also, but what you're looking for is basically, you know, like a very strong uh, pesticide that is going to kill the insect on contact, which could be found with synthetic um, pesticides. But in terms of organic, uh, pesticides, they normally work a little slower, they may not be that strong, but Dr. Mihindo, you can comment on that also, but for me, I've also, I've always find that the safest way is actually just to use the sticky traps or the pheromone traps, as has been advised. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. I, I would say that if you listen to what I say, uh, you have to start an IVF program early before you, you even uh, start planting, so you, if you start by hanging the the, the the yellow traps, you'll have no problems with the with the white uh, white flies, and that is basically what we have used. And I don't have a remedy for uh, like a uh, like a pesticide against uh, against white flies. But we, as as uh, Sylvia says, we have been using the the yellow and the blue trap the, the attractants. Thank you, Natari. Is another follow-up question. How pheromones should be placed in a one acre land? From Collins Chibole. <laughs> which, uh, I think he should be uh, more specific. Which pheromones? Which which crops is he planting? Is he planting because you know different pests attack different crops. So and also the the type of pheromone uh, matters. Okay. What we can also do. Uh, if mm -hmm. you don't mind, since your organization also uh, sells the uh, traps, you can mm -hmm. also share your number for uh, the people who are listening to reach out and learn more yes. about how to use the uh, pheromones trap. Is that okay? Yes. Our number is 0706 966 980. And we are, we are also now in the process of organizing some. Uh, is, uh, some integrated pest management trainings where we shall be talking about some of this. If, if you talk about pheromone traps, we can train you for uh, a whole day. And uh, I think we shall be circulating that information to different organizations so that uh, they, we can uh, all participate. Thank you. Okay, thank you. There are other questions in the chat about the traps, expiry, I believe I have posted uh, Dr. Mihindo's number. 
feel free to reach out for more details on that. But we have another question from, let me just go through, <clears throat> about crop rotation. I think that's on your hand on. Then we have this one, I don't know if you're able to answer from Patrick about products from real IPM, are they really organic? And can we recommend our farmers to use uh, those products? If you cannot answer, it's okay, but if you can, please yeah, yeah, I, I would say that uh, I, 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 I don't use products from real IPM because for sure, I don't know if they are organic or not. Real IPM is a, is a, is a private company. But uh, what they say is that they are they are they are they are they are partially organic. If you are not careful with the type of uh, of uh, IPM you are using, you may end up using some of the uh, the chemicals just like any other person. And that is why we are calling ourselves Effective IPM Association, so that we want to use. IPM that is effective. We don't want to say that we are not using chemicals and we are using chemicals. So I can't uh, testify that they are uh, organic or not. Uh, let me make a comment. Um, thanks, Dr. Mihindo. It's true that uh, like you find some organizations actually uh, that are practicing IPM, you know, uh, what normally happens is the last intervention would be synthetic chemicals, but then they actually have some products which are organic and they are from Isipe, uh, like the metarisiums. So they have metarisiums 68, 69, and 70, no, 69, uh, 72, and 78, which are organic and are produced um, at Isipe. But then again, um, yeah, do your research and find out. But some of their products are organic for uh, managing um, uh, millibugs, strips, spider mites. Um, yes. Yeah, yeah. So some of them are the metarisiums are and the trichoderma, the trichoderma, uh, which is a good soil amendment. Uh, yes, yes. Yeah, and yeah, then, like uh, yeah. I'd also like to add that uh, there are some there are, we have some chemicals that are also around in organic agriculture. Those are that are copper based and also sulfur based, and that is why even in uh, in our in the concoctions that we make, like for us, we make what we call the the, the sulfur the lime sulfur blue. Which is a combination of uh, of sulfur and, uh, and and lime, which is because sulfur is a, is allowed in organic agriculture. Thank you. Uh, there's a question from Hosea about the termite remedy. Can I use the same aloe plus ethanol mixture on mulch by spraying the liquid on mulch bedding? I think the innovation yeah, of aloe. I, I, I want to say I want to say that uh, termites are uh, termites are a very very uh, difficult pest to to, to 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 manage because you only manage the termite when you get the queen. Unless you get the queen, then you have done nothing. So the best thing is uh, even when you do the concoction, make sure that you get the the, the, the cardinal hole where. Where well, the, 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 the liquid will reach the queen. Otherwise, the easiest method is to just dig and remove the queen. I have just said that yesterday I was digging my rod and uh, I, I removed like uh, seven queens. And they are big, they are, they are big, like, uh, like, uh, like uh, seven centimeters, very big. And this queen, uh, even if you kill the, the small termites and you don't kill the queen, she will keep on laying her eggs and, uh, and, and, and again, the colony will still uh, uh, develop. So it is good to remove the queen and make sure that uh, you, kill, you, you, kill, you, you kill her before now. So if, if you, you go and spray on your, on, on, your, on your crops, you have not solved any problem unless you, you remove the queen. Thank you. We have two questions from uh, Facebook. The first one is from Wa Mami. When is the best time to put on the traps, mostly in mango trees? Is it when flowering or maybe some other time? And then there's a question to Dr. Mihindo in terms of those biopesticides. Are they registered by the government of Kenya? Thank you. 
That's from no. Paul Chilewa. No, okay, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll uh, start by saying maybe Sylvia will tackle the first one. Uh, let me tackle the second one. The the pesticide, the biopesticides that I have uh, shared are all developed by different companies, and they they are they are around in Kenya. They can they, uh, they can be you can buy them on the shelves. So they 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 have gone through the government regulation, and they are they, they, they are okay. Some of the pesticides that we are using, we it is very very difficult to register a botanical pesticide in Kenya. But we are trying to, to, to register. So the, we are using them locally among the farmers as we trade. And I think that should be the thread because if something is working, then uh, the farmer should be able to use it as we try to register it. However, the federal monoplant shops are registered by, by, by the government. So the, the federal monoplants have no problem. Thank you, Sylvia. Yeah, okay, yeah. yeah, yes, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. <laughs> Let me comment uh, real quick on the um, uh, the mangoes. I'm not a mango farmer, uh, but I can give my experience from having used pheromone traps with that. We have lost Sylvia. Uh, the earlier, the better. A pheromone immediately i plant my uh in the nursery have you lost me we are losing you see. hello can you hear me hello yes we can, can hear you, you. yes we can hear you now please repeat Hello, Sylvia. If not, uh, Dr. Mihino, maybe just respond. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we have lost her. I, I think uh, he has asked what is the the appropriate time to raise. Uh oh. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Can you can you? hear me now. Yes. Okay, so, uh, well, well, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry about that. So saying from my, my idea of pheromone traps, the earlier the better. I was giving a quick example about my tomatoes and see if you can relate it to mangoes. When I'm planting tomatoes in my nursery, I normally put the pheromone trap for tuta absoluta just when they start germinating. And that normally helps me to be able to manage the uh, population of tuta absoluta very early. And I make sure that I change my pheromone trap every four to six weeks, because you'll find the viability depending on the company or how it works will not be able to be very effective after six weeks. So it also depends, you have to do a lot of um, observations. So you have to look at your sticker to see what is the population of the, um, uh, you know, the pests. You know, what's the population of the fruit flies? Of course, if the whole sticker is full of fruit flies, it means infestation is very high and you need to be able to add another trap. So I do that. And then before I transplant my tomatoes in the field, I actually put the pheromone trap in the field before I transplant my tomatoes so that I can catch them before they actually, I actually transplant. And then again, I change the trap every four to six weeks, depending on the infestation and depending on how uh, many they are. And also more than six weeks, again, the pheromone may not be effective. So for mangoes, I would recommend then just before flowering, you can start working with the pheromone trap and then observe very closely and change the traps um, depending on the infestation. I hope that's clear. Thank you. I think that's clear. And in case anyone has more follow-up questions, I've posted Dr. Mehino's number. They offer a variety of services as an organization. I think Dr. Mihindo, maybe you can just mention what kind of services can our listeners uh, get from your organization? Thank you. Yeah, before I, I mentioned that, somebody asked about powdery mildew, and uh, I would like to say that powdery mildew is, uh, the cause is mainly when the, 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 the soil is, uh, is it uh, dry, but uh, the plant is has humidity? So one of the things that you can do is uh, when you are when you are 
when when you are applying water, make sure that you use overhead there. Eh? Overhead sprinkling, and then make sure that uh, there is good aeration in your in your field. I think uh, you 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 will uh, avoid powdery mildew. It is not hard to avoid powdery mildew. It's not a difficult uh, disease to to, uh, to to control. And uh, the most important thing that uh, when the low the soil has low moisture and then there is high humidity. Uh, the the plant the, the your plants will get powdery mildew. Two things: overhead sprinkling, and then uh, making sure that there is good air circulation. Yes, our organization, Effective IP Association, we do trainings. We do offer trainings on different areas. We offer trainings on integrated pest management. All those things that I have talked about. If you want to know about them, uh, we we do that. We do trainings on the uh, specific crops we, of, of, of choice. So we have got different agroecological topics to, uh, that we cover. And we also, uh, we also do trainings on uh, the issue of agroforestry. We have, uh, we have nurseries that uh, are offering trainings on how to manage fruit trees, how to manage herbs, how to manage spices. All, the, all, all that. So that is the work that we do. Thank you very much. Thank you, Natari. I believe we have now concluded our day three in terms of IPM methods. Uh, maybe you can stop sharing, it's fine. Now, in okay. case you have not registered, please register on the link in the Facebook chat. We are going to share the notes from all the days of training. Tomorrow we have a session from 10 to 12 on seeds and propagation. One of our trainers, Esther and Deritu, they are online. Maybe I just mentioned something to preempt people to, to join. Esther, mm -hmm. do you mind just mentioning a, a bit? And Mr. Deritu, about tomorrow. Any of you who is uh, online? I would like to say that uh, seed is the most important, uh, one of the most important inputs uh, when it comes to agricultural production. And, and <laughs> when you're talking about seeds, about open pollinated or higher loom varieties or indigenous seeds, that's what we'll be talking about tomorrow. And so we would like people to tune in so that we learn more about seeds, seed production, seed saving, and, and all that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, our listeners, for tuning in. See you tomorrow from 10 to 12 noon. For today, I want to, before I conclude, uh, let me invite Francis, the project manager for this project that has brought us here. Let me, he can say a few remarks before we finish. Thank you very much, Ratemo. I was actually uh, already putting up the hand to say, I think this is, uh, this is a very commendable um, initiative that uh, master trainers in Kenya have uh, actually taken on. Uh, Ratemo, thank you very much for organizing this and making sure that we can listen in from wherever we are. And the master trainers for doing such a wonderful and uh, commendable job of enriching farmers and partners uh, using the the technology. I think this is something that we can, uh, you know, spread to other other countries, and we get to have similar um, sessions like this from all the CIPs. So I just wanted to underscore the fact that you are doing a great job. Thank you, all the master trainers of Kenya, and thank you, uh, Ratem and Pelam Kenya for this wonderful initiative. So over to you and bye-bye. Thank you. Sorry, I'm yes. using my desktop, so uh, I can't show my picture, but you know me. <laughs> I am yeah. using my desktop without a camera. Thanks. No problem. Yes. Esther, do you want to say something before we finish? What do people expect tomorrow from you? Thank you so much, Ratemo. Sorry, uh, my, my laptop, hanged a bit, so I was unable to unmute. So uh, tomorrow we are preparing to learn about uh, seeds. 
and uh, how to sit sit so be prepared be our guest and thank you so much for following our trainings thank you if, if you can put your video on please put we say goodbye to our listeners so bye bye and thank you so much for joining thank bye. you thank you bye bye, bye. Bye. Thank you. I have stopped the live stream. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. So see you tomorrow from 10 to see 12. You. See you.